So um, coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan was, you know, it was great to be home and all, but what really helped me spark the rifle project was passing uh, this sign every day. This is Andrew Biggio Square, and the first thing you'll think is if people know me, they'll say, hey, that's your square, because my name is also Andrew Biggio. Uh, the problem is it's not my square. It was my grandfather's brother who was killed in action in World War II uh, at, at the age of 19. Um, and every day as a uh, combat veteran myself passing this sign, I decided to take it upon myself and find out what happened to the first Andrew Biggio on that hill in Italy. Um, Andrew Biggio, the one we were just talking about who was killed in action, uh, he was the last time he hugged his family, hugged his father right on this front porch right here. It's also the same porch that I left from as well. So it was kind of an uneasy feeling knowing that the last Andrew Biggio to go to war didn't come home uh, and luckily I was fortunate enough to be able to. When I was reading Andrew's letters that he wrote home before he was killed in Italy, uh, I found one particular letter on how much he enjoyed this rifle, the M1 Grand. And um, for me as an infantryman myself in the Marine Corps, I had a it connected me right to this long lost relative. I said, I want to go out and purchase an M1 Grand, have it in the family. This is the rifle that he carried when he, was, when he died. And I went out and bought an M1 Grand. I came back to this house, I'm waving it around my room, I'm looking in the mirror with it, and then I said, okay, that's great, now what? I said to myself, well, who can I show this rifle to? And then I said, my neighbor, my neighbor, Joe Drago, was in the Battle of Okinawa. He was a Marine in the battle, one of the worst battles of World War II. So I went and knocked on his door, and at this time, at age in his life, he was 92, and he was pretty much bound to his recliner. You know, he's, his legs had atrophied, his, he was he's weak and old, you know. And as soon as I put this rifle in his hands, he had this burst of energy. He started waving the rifle around, smile from ear to ear. Oh my God, I haven't held one of these in so long. And ha ha, and he's laughing. And I had to move out of the way because he's swinging this rifle around. And he starts telling me all these stories about the Battle of Okinawa. And I said, wow, like I have something special here. And uh, I said, I, I want to remember this forever. Sign your name on this rifle, Joe. And he refused to do it and, uh, until I finally talked him into it. And he signed right there, Joe Drago. I Company, 3rd Battalion, 22nd Marines, Battle of Okinawa. I made it a mission, um, you call it therapy, call it research, call it what have you, of meeting these men that we've been reading about our whole lives and these are the men why most of us had joined the military. World War II, jumping into Normandy, the Battle of the Bulge, the flag raising on Iwo Jima. Today's veterans literally live in the shadows of these men and I took it upon myself to go see each one and interview them and learn how to live a successful life after combat. This rifle is signed by approximately 93 World War II veterans. About 30 of them on this have already passed away. This project was started in 2017 and it was my way of the youngest generation of veterans saying goodbye to the oldest generation of veterans, which is our World War II veterans. Um, the VA says there's less than 300,000 World War II veterans still alive of the 16 million who served during World War II. If you look here uh, on the inside of the uh, the upper receiver is a name of uh, Albert Bucciarelli. Albert served with the 3rd Infantry Division during World War II. Um, if you're familiar with the 3rd Infantry Division, they invaded Anzio and they were also in the Battle of Monte Cassino, Italy, uh, fighting some of Hitler's uh, best German troops. Well, Albert, at age 19, was laying wire down and an artillery shell landed in front of him, killed his sergeant, and blew off Albert's leg. Albert, uh, he didn't want to go home from the war after that. He was laying there with one leg in Italy, and uh, he told the nurses, told the doctors, I don't want to go home. He was very embarrassed, ashamed that he was gonna be maimed for the rest of his life. And uh, unfortunately, it wasn't his choice, but naturally the army would eventually send him home. Um, 
Today he's 94 years old. He's never been back to Italy, even with his family wanting to go on vacation in the 70s and 80s to, to Italy as a family vacation, he still refused to go. I believe they still went without him. Um, he has avoided veterans organizations, groups, reunions his entire life until now. Um, I spoke with his family and I thought the best way to surprise him with a trip back to Italy would be at my annual event, the Boston's Wounded Vet Run. Uh, Boston's Wounded Vet Run, also known as TheyFoughtWeRide.com, is, is geared to severely wounded veterans of Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, it started nine years ago with a small motorcycle charity ride to help him, a soldier get a new roof on his house and part of a new walkway, and it just spawned into helping over hundreds of, of wounded veterans with all sorts of needs and also building them a family, the biker community who looks after them and now they all take part in our events all over the country with us. Um, we gave them a new hobby, new motivation and just new people to uh, look over them while they're living life with the injuries that they'll have to be dealing with for the rest of their life. We brought him on stage and we announced that he, his stepdaughter and his wife would return to Italy for the first time. And we're going back for the 75th anniversary of the liberation of Rome. We're gonna close out that, that chapter of your life and uh, we have tickets for you to go to Italy back to where you were wounded. You're going back, brother. Us bringing him back for the first time in 75 years, we're gonna visit the Anzio beachhead where he had landed in Italy. We're going to visit the Rome National American Cemetery where 3,000 Americans are still buried. And we're going to be in the vicinity of Monte Cassino, one of the bloodiest battles of World War II, where Albert lost his leg. The second soldier we're bringing back is uh, the young age, he turned 94 today. His name's Rocco Talese. Um, if you want to talk about a best friend of mine, he lives down the street from me. He's 94 years old, has all his wits. He served with the 85th Infantry Division uh, in Italy. And the last time he was back for the, for, in Rome was for the 50th anniversary of the liberation. And he got to meet actually President Clinton in the cemetery. I have a nice photo of him. Um, his health has declined and he's been very nervous about this trip. But I assured him we have a whole team of people that are gonna help him, push him in a wheelchair if we have to, make sure he's on the plane, um, in the right seats on the plane. And he knows that we're not gonna abandon him out there and that we're gonna be there for him, so. This is a once in a lifetime opportunity to bring these guys back to where they fought because in five years we are not going to have any World War II veterans left. So when June came finally rolling around and it was game day to travel from Boston to Rome, I picked up Rocco at his house the next town over and he brought on this suitcase into my truck that was covered in dust because he hadn't traveled to the since the 90s. And him and I and Al went over to Logan Airport and the Massachusetts State Police were waiting for us along with Massport Fire and they were all saluting uh, these two veterans that are returning to where they fought in World War II. At that moment I knew that we were doing something amazing. Here were these you know, cops and firefighters who weren't coming on a trip with us but were making sure they showed their respect for these people returning to where they helped save the world. Looking out that window and finally seeing the Italian landscape, I know that we, we were finally doing this. We were bringing two men in their 90s back to where they fought in Italy. Our first full day in Italy started right from the hotel lobby. And I wanted to do some simple sightseeing, considering that most of the fighting in World War II, the ground combat happened outside of Rome. It happened in the mountains, happened in the fields, happened in the hills, happened in the, uh, the olive vineyards. So what we did was we just got on a double-decker sightseeing bus and started to see the area.
The tour started through the streets of Rome and some of the sites that we were able to see were the Colosseum, the Ark of Constantine, Circus Maximus. Uh, these were particular locations that our troops did march past when they did liberate Rome. Fifth Army men drive through the city, past the Colosseum, place of ancient Roman holidays of quite a different nature. They took 200,000 casualties in Italy, holding 30 German divisions on the peninsula so that they didn't reinforce the Normandy front, they didn't reinforce the Russian front, and because the operations in Normandy happened two days later on June 6th, we don't remember June 4th, the liberation of Rome, and that's why Italy has become the forgotten front. If Rome, Italy, and had been taken by the Germans, God only knows what would have happened. Once the sightseeing bus was over, I wanted to get a little bit more personal, so I took both of the veterans, we got inside of a cab, and we went directly to the Colosseum. I knew that this was a landmark that, especially Rocco, had marched past 75 years ago when they were liberating Rome. I could see the look on Al's face, you know, here he is, he's 94 years old and had never seen this worldly image that we see everywhere in calendars, textbooks, TV, and uh, I was glad he finally got to see it. You know, he didn't get to see it in World War II because he was wounded before they took Rome. I never got this far. They, they nailed me a few miles south of here. This I never expected. And last, I left here in February of 43, went back to the States. I wasn't up here long enough to know what was going on. All I know is what the, I was told after I got hit, and that wasn't too much. I did what I could, and here I am. I was one of the fortunate ones that got picked up right off after I got hit. Within 20 minutes after I got hit, I was on my way to the hospital. That first night of all of us sitting down together and breaking bread and raising a toast, um, we had basically accomplished a lot because we were here, we were finally in Italy. Roger, we're going to do a toast. Rocco's praying. Oh, yeah. Yep. To Albert and Rocco's return to Italy. Okay. 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 75 years. Hello. When the World War II veterans were going to get some rest after that long day of travel, myself and the other chaperones went out to see Rome for ourselves. You know, something a little bit of a pleasure for us being there for the first time as well. Going to see the Vatican for the first time and thanking God for letting me be a part of bringing these World War II veterans back was something I really needed to accomplish. When we woke up that morning, I knew we were gonna have so much to squeeze in such a little time frame, but the first stop had to be the Rome American National Cemetery. As we left Rome and began to travel south to towards the Anzio beachhead where our American forces had uh, invaded the uh, you know central Italy. It was there we would meet our tour guides and you know start making our way towards the cemetery. Buongiorno. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. He's 94. He was with the 85th Infantry Division. Nice to meet you, Enrico. You okay? Yes, yes. Good. <laughs> That was it. Albert, I'm from Cisterna. This place doesn't look like it did. Uh, huh? We went through here. Quite a difference. 
that was uh, the Marine Corps. You ready? Yep. Alright, we're going to load up, we're going to head to the American Cemetery. Right. When we got to the cemetery, the first person we had a little meet and greet with was the manager of the cemetery. It was very rare for him to see two living World War II veterans return to this site, and he was ready and prepared to give us a good demonstration of the grounds of the cemetery. We are all part of American Battle Monuments Commission, as you can read in that panel there. We are the smallest commission of the U.S. government, and in this specific facility, uh, we are, were created actually 75 years ago, two days later, two days after the Anzio Levy. There are several reasons why you have a U.S. cemetery abroad. In this specific facility, we have 490 unknown soldiers. Unknown. We have 30 sets of brothers, so the families decided to leave them together, for instance. Another reason is because here, there will always be someone who will take care of them cut the grass, keep the Heston wide, and keep the memory alive. They had a little showroom floor, kind of like a museum, where we began to watch a sm uh, small film about the fighting in Italy. Those who fell in battle, those who sacrificed to shape a better future for Italy and the world. We honor all of them here, in the Sicily Rome American Cemetery. We looked at photos of Medal of Honor recipients, patches of all the different units that fought in Italy to include Al's and Rocco's 85th Division patch and 3rd ID patch. This one up here is Maya. There's Maya over there. Which one? That one right there? Uh, CD, yeah. Custom Division. Watching Al and Rocco's eyes look at all the different photos and artifacts in that tiny museum was really cool and it was good to see them reminisce about the time they served during World War II. What happened? At the deep mud, because I was in the hospital at the, uh, above Florence and we were walking deep in mud. Now look at that mud. It stuck to your ankle, you know? Yeah. That's a good pitch. Bill Malden, one of the greatest, had his Jeep. He couldn't move. He got <laughs> Bill Malden. Tanks were stopped, you couldn't move through. The torrential rain. That was a that was a worse winter. When the winter came on. Yeah. And tanks can't move, you got a problem. Yeah. It's for, their division engineers built a new bridge at Acerno, Italy. Forty three. Boy, them Bailey bridges, they would put a Bailey bridge in the morning and it would be knocked out and the engineers would come right back and build it back over again. Yeah. Unbelievable. This was the I, know, I, know, I, know, I know how the heck they did it, but they did it. After leaving the information center on the cemetery, we put Al and Rocco in some golf carts and began to bring them to a specific plot. Are you all good? Okay. All right, cool. <laughs> See you in church. <laughs> Al only remembered his squad leader's name by his first name as Ray. As we approached this plot of graves, unbeknownst to Al, he was walking upon the gravesite of his squad leader. I wanted everyone to take a step back and give him some privacy because it was really just about to hit him. He had never seen a squad leader's grave before. Um, he didn't know that I had located the squad leader's grave. All we had to go on was the first name of Ray. I researched every Ray that was buried in Rome National Cemetery, which was about, I believe, somewhere between eight and 14 Raymonds or Rays. However, the dead giveaway was the day Ray was killed. It was the same day that Al lost his leg and that Ray belonged to the same regiment, the same division, the same company, and it was Ray James from Kentucky. 
It's something that, that hit me, and I don't know. I didn't know him that well, but I know him. And hey, he's gone. God bless him. I'll never be able to tell you what Al was feeling at that moment. I wanted to give him his space. I told everyone that was on our trip to take a step back and I could see Al talking to himself like, as if, hey, sorry, it's taken so long for me to come visit you kind of deal. And as soon as Al began to lose his balance and get emotional, that's when I know I had to go over there and, uh, and greet him. And the hug that Al gave me, I know he wasn't hugging me, he was hugging Ray. He said, that barrage started, he says, let's hit the, hit the ground. He says, who knows where that shells are gonna land. And we were there and about the fifth shell of that barrage is what got us. Never heard it coming until it was too late. And then bingo, it hit Ray directly. Ray had his feet on my shoulder. We were head to foot or whatever. And he got, a hundred percent of the shell got to him. I got the outskirts of it, which was bad enough. But hey, it happened, it happened. And when we got to the cemetery, Andy had found out where he was, who he was, all we had to go by was his first name, I didn't know his last name. I didn't know where he was from or anything. That morning, he had just come back from rest area. That was his last four hours on earth. He took the blunt of a shell, which was a shell that dropped, they tell me, about a half a mile short of his target. So that was the end of it. I was fortunate. There was three guys pulling the guard duty out there. They came down after the barrage was over, and we were in an old and a riverbed that was dry, with four German trucks out there all burned up. They scared me more when they came down around those trucks than getting hit. They saw what had happened. They loaded me on a Jeep and hooked me off to the hospital. It was well, from the time I got hit till I got to the hospital it was an hour or less, which it was very fortunate. I laid on the hospital floor for nine hours before I got to the operating room. I gave up two chances to the two pilots that were injured, worst. I, I say worse than I was, so I always say things could be worse. You can always find somebody that's worse off than you are. And I got in the operating room around 9, 9.30, and Major from Boston operated on me, and he said, you're going home. That was it. Hey, as I say, I was lucky. I'm here today, which is more than a lot of them can say. So we began to finish up the uh, cemetery visit with uh, paying homage to uh, Robert Waugh, who was a Medal of Honor recipient from the 85th Division. Rocco had previously decorated his grave uh, during the 50th anniversary of the liberation of Rome back in 1995. Hey, I was here the 30th, Rob. On the 50th and the 75th, but uh, we got no dignitaries for here today, except uh, well, and you? Uh, no, no, no. Yes, we got two. Uh, we got Al from uh, and uh, myself. I got your home, a historical set. I made his home with a plaque in Rhode Island, and I try changing the school name for you. Guess what? Your legislative state. Well, all I got this time. <laughs> There's something for this. Yep. Yeah. 
Ezra. That's the third hour. I won't be seeing any more unless we're at the pearly gates of St. Peter. <laughs> I saw him three times, you know what I mean? The 80th, the 50th, and the 75th. Maybe we'll get a present in the 100th to come over here and... I don't know. That's it. See ya. Rocco uh, is a different breed of animal. He's, he wasn't afraid to come back and remember the fallen for the last, uh, this is his third trip back to Italy. Uh, he was back for the 30th anniversary of the liberation of Rome, the 50th and the 75th. Uh, he's a little let down that this is the 75th and there's, we're pretty much the only people here in the cemetery. Uh, because back at the 50th, the U.S. president was here, there was government officials here, there was marching bands, and so it's, it is definitely a, a sign that we're somewhat forgetting. Obviously, we're not entirely forgetting because this place is beautiful and being up kept perfectly, but it's not being uh, as celebrated as much as it used to be. We proceeded our way up the hill and we saw the hall filled of men and women's names who have gone missing in action that were never found during the Italian campaign, as well as a nice monument dedicated to the Army and Navy uh, connection to serving in Italy. Point that out, huh? Right there. Travis Hill. Right yeah. There. yeah. That's where two boxes, yeah. No, we are about to do a Oh, there, it's got the 85th up there. Through the part time marshes, there's the 85th here. To Tremont Soli, then it follows, 85th follows over there to, uh, uh, and then Terracina. Oh, that's where we, the first time we had to take an Anzio. We had to go to the water in Terracina. Some huh? men from the Custer Division. Jeez, your life was The, the patch is a huh? CD. The patch on the shoulder is a CD, Custer Division. CD, right. One little kid got me. I said, how come you want to fetch you with me? He said, well, when I go back to school one day, he said, I can tell him I was going to go or two back. And he said, I got his picture to prove it. It was nice to end the day with the tour guides presenting them some gifts we brought, uh, but more importantly, they were so ecstatic to see two living World War II veterans that they don't get to see every day in Italy, and presented them with some photo books that they published themselves. Thank you. Hey, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank the front that's the stern. Yeah, the front line. The front, the that's, front line that's the stern. So, uh, yeah. my name is uh, Stefano Zolferini. I'm from uh, Cisterna. And uh, um, today, with our two veterans, uh, I want to give them a book I made on, on my city, Cisterna, a photographic book, uh, as a, a kind of pleasure, as, a, um, as a, I want to say thanks to what the veterans did for us, for me, for my family, and uh, for all the Italy, for everybody, 75 years ago, because they, they liberated our our city, the liberated our nation. And so I only have to say thank you. Thank you a lot. The only reason why the memory here for our veterans is kept alive is because of Italians like Enrico. Mm -hmm. And so we'd like to present him with this. Oh. And that. Um, because we know. You know, there's not Americans here doing it, we understand it's the Italian people. And my uncle was killed on the Gothic line, my grandfather's brother with the Red Bull Division. In Barbarino, Italy. In Barbarino. Yeah, so this is for you. Grazie. Yeah, no problem. Today is unbelievable. I, I never thought I would see the day that I'd be here, except the honor. They, I thanked a lot. I, I was able to come back home and then after all these years, 
come and get remembered by the townspeople and the, everybody. I'm really overjoyed. This is my sixth trip, and this is the most memorable one because it will probably be my last. Mm. And uh, so I enjoyed the 30th, the 50th, and now the 75th anniversary of the liberation of Rome. So I couldn't be any more happier. I'm not in very good health conditions, but uh, I made it. After we wrapped up the cemetery visit, uh, we proceeded to have lunch. And while we did so, we, we traveled through these the local areas and the villages of Italy that still, you could still see some battle damage. We are in uh, Cisterna, exactly in uh, Isola Bella. Uh, as you can see, these are two columns uh, uh, with um, still original bullet holes. We are in the place when, uh, in late January 1944, the first, uh, third and uh, fourth Ranger Battalion fought, uh, and uh, they were all uh, captured by the Germans, uh, right in this, in this area in front of us. We ultimately ended up at the Anzio beachhead where all our ground forces had uh, assaulted central Italy. The assault on Anzio was super important because our ground forces in Italy were getting bogged down near the Monte Cassino in the Rapido River area. So they wanted to find a new way to liberate Rome and that was really just go around and assault another port and get our ground forces on a new front to fight the Germans. There was one remaining bunker uh, on the Anzio beachhead that Alan Rocco got to close up and take a look at. And it was really neat to see them smile and laugh as if they had just, uh, you know, won the war again. Hi there. After the Second World War, there were many of these bunkers along all the seaside shore. But after that, most of them were ruined. So the reason why this is here is just because it has been considered like a masterpiece. So they put a roof that now is completely covered with rust, but it's still there, like, a, a, let's say, a masterpiece and a monument. The day finished up with another great meal, um, not far from the hotel. We got to reminisce about what we saw and what we're gonna see, and. Even Rocco got to have a little dance with uh, Karen, uh, Al's stepdaughter, and that was so fun to see. Once we wrapped up dinner, and I knew both of those World War II veterans were putting their head on their pillow for the night, I escaped off into downtown Rome myself. I got to visit the Pantheon, the Trevi Fountain, and really got to reflect on what we had accomplished that day once-in-a-lifetime experience that may never re be repeated and to think that it's all because of that rifle uh, was really a breath of fresh air. On the last day I knew we were going to be pushing it to the limit with our veterans. Uh, it had been a long week and we were just about to scratch the surface on some of the main battlegrounds. Driving through the vineyards and outskirts of Italy again, we ended up at a World War II monument park. The park consisted of some tanks, artillery pieces, things left behind during the war, and there we were greeted by Damiano, uh, a local Italian who helped preserve the area. Uh, sir, what do you remember about the weather here during the war? We are talking uh, of November. Yeah, well, when I came, when I, when I got hit, the weather was about like this. But the week before, it was raining. But to know where I was, I wasn't here long enough to find out what was what. Okay. All I know is what I was told. That I was, got, where I got hit was not too far from Casino, was the beginning of the battle for Casino. Yeah. So that's the place where we are now. You can clearly see that this is the Via Casilina, the only uh, accessible road to Rome at, at the time. Uh, the, so the, the, they said that it was on the main road. The main road. And we're road, maybe 1,500 feet off of the road, 
Mm. And the engineers are putting up a bridge on this road and knocked the bridge out. So it's clear that if you wanted to go to casino, you had to see these positions. Mm. They were very important. It must be in this area. As I, say, I, I, as I say, I wasn't up here long enough to really find out where I was or what was around. I was learning all but sure. It was there we gave him some t-shirts, some Boston Moon of own swag as a thank you. Uh, and then they continued to take us into a museum. Al, I, I want you to give him this patch for you with your uh, third ID logo on there. So. That's great. And this is, this is our organization that we help different wounded veterans yeah. every year. And this one's for you. Oh, we thank are, you. Last year we did the first, help come the first ID for 10th Mountain. Yeah. 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 We are really honored and we, 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 we appreciate it because we respect you, uh, your comrades, and yeah. all the efforts yeah. you yeah. did during the war. Because yeah. if we live in democracy, if we can live freedom, it's because you fought here, because you liberated your this boys country, too. and we appreciate it, and Thank we have you. to transfer it to the new generation. Yes. That's why your presence here is why really precious, yeah. valuable. Yeah. Yeah. So, sirs, we are we really appreciate your presence here. We are really honored to have you here. Please accept well. this very small Thank gift you very much. for you. It's the cap of our Grazie. 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 The first battleground our guides brought us to was the village and formerly village of San Pietro. San Pietro was a very pivotal battle during the Second World War where the 36th Infantry Division really got into some bloody fighting with the Germans there. In 1943, it was one of our strategic aims to draw as many German forces as possible away from the Russian front and French coastal areas and to contain them on the Italian peninsula while liberating as much of Italy as might be possible with the means at our disposal. As the bulk of our supplies was directed to England for the forthcoming invasion, operations in Italy had to be conducted on an extremely limited scale. Thus it came about that during the winter months, the number of allied divisions in Italy was greatly reduced. Yet so determined was their effort that they succeeded in holding in Italy a very large number of German divisions during the pre-invasion period. San Pietro in the 5th Army sector was the key to the Leary Valley. We knew it and the enemy knew it. We had to take it even though the immediate cost would be high. We took it and the cost in relation to the later advance was not excessive. By its very nature, this success worked bitter hardship upon each individual soldier, calling for the full measure of his courage and devotion. The response of our Fifth Army troops provides an inspiring page in our military history. Going in to see in the village where some of the other veterans on my rifle had fought, not just Rocco and Al, was really moving because the landscape and the terrain it must have been to fight the Germans on an elevated position uh, led to really the town being evacuated. There was a lot of ruins, there was a lot of uh, old abandoned buildings and cobblestone roads that really led to nothing because after the war fighting that took place there, it was pretty much abandoned and set up further down into the valley. Being at San Pietro with Rocco and Al uh, was, was not just symbolic for their return to Italy, but the other veterans I had interviewed who signed the rifle who fought in San Pietro, especially with the 36th Division. We call this the Pompeii of the 20th century because it's like a time capsule. You can clearly see the effects of the fighting in this kind of environment. The next location we were brought to wasn't exactly a place that Al and Rocco fought, but it was where thousands of American GIs made the ultimate sacrifice during World War II, and that was the Rapido River, also known as the Gari River. This river was attempted to be crossed several times by our American soldiers, and to really no success. 
as the Germans had fortified the area with mines, bob wire, machine guns, artillery zeroed in, and thousands of men died and became a very traumatic event and a blunder of World War II. The, the Fifth Army really wanted to cross that river because they just simply wanted to make their way towards Rome. They wanted to advance north up into Italy and the mission was a complete disaster. Complete disaster and unbeknownst to the men who were falling and dying there that the Anzio invasion was planned to go around that whole area. We call this river the Bloody River because in just two days you had about uh, 1,700 casualties, 1, a lot. Because we had to contain 23 German divisions here. This became known as the Forgotten Front. Just being up here, going to war, is tough. You don't know what's going on. Although it was a somber event revisiting this location where thousands of men lost their lives, it was also a good reminder to see how appreciative the Italians were for the sacrifice as they came to the location, greeted Alan Rocco, and actually interviewed them themselves with their own TV access program. Ultimately, we ended up having a, a great lunch in this local village, one of the best lunches we had since being in Italy. We reminisced the day and talked about what was next was Monte Cassino, one of the biggest, bloodiest battles of World War II. And, Leaving the restaurant, we had to descend up this windy hill all the way up to the top of the mountain that overlooked the whole valley of this location in Italy. Reaching the summit of Monte Cassino, you'll find that church abbey. And it's one of the most well-known battles of the Italian campaign. This is the monastery that sits on top of the mountain in the town of Cassino, Italy. Um, as you can see, it's been rebuilt, but if you see this left-hand corner here, you can actually see shrapnel marks um, from when it was originally completely obliterated by a pack of B-17 bombers. Why was it bombed? Well, in Italy, the Germans' artillery was so precise and the Moors were so precise, the U.S. government thought for sure that there were German enemy spotters in this monastery overlooking the whole region, the whole area. The uh, Americans at first gave Italy and all the priests in the area promises that they would never destroy this abbey, but our casualties were mounting so high that they decided to destroy it. This left corner, I'm sure there's gonna be a lot of other more damage you'll be able to see, but this whole thing's been rebuilt since. Welcome to Monte Cassino Abbey. I'm Selena, I will be your guide. And so, welcome back to you. Welcome to the others. Well, during the Second World War, the city of Cassino was situated on the so-called Gustav Line one of the three German defense lines against the advance of the Allies on Rome. And it was a mistake because the German soldiers were, weren't inside the Abbey, they were in the mountains around. But after the bombing, the Germans occupied the ruins of Monte Cassino as a key defense point against the Allies. Al and Rocco at this rate were now both in wheelchairs. They couldn't walk after had been on their feet all day, but pushing them through the halls of this church and this abbey that took so much of our US troops and allied forces to take, um, I couldn't help but to think how it symbolized the sacrifices and the exhaustion that it did to take the whole area. <clears throat> I know both those World War II veterans found peace inside of that monastery because when Rocco removed himself from his wheelchair and walked up the stairs of the altar unassisted, holding on to the side of it, I know he was just making his, uh, his peace with God and he was very happy to be there. Proceeding down that windy road again, Rocco started pestering me about visiting this village called Tremensoli. He had been carrying around these old photos, these old notes and documents the whole trip and really wanted to visit the Polar Bear Monument of the 85th Division and try to find some ammo box he left back there in 1944. So we reached Tremensoli, wasn't, which wasn't well known to our tour guides. You could barely squeeze vehicles through the roads and the, and the uh, buildings. But we found some locals kind of sitting on the corner smoking some cigarettes and asked them if they had known where the 85th Division Monument was. Well, we're at Tremensoli, there's supposed to be a, a monument that we put up here in 1992. And it was a hard thing to take. This place was uh, heavily fortified, and we have two boxes here. 
but <laughs> I don't know where they're going to find them now. Uh, uh, so there's a restaurant at the top of the hill. This must be the restaurant at the top of the hill. Uh, let's go find out. Ma forse forse si vedeva cosa. Conosce lei. Conosce lei. Questa. Ma forse lei. Conosce lei. Conosce lei. Conosce lei. Conosce lei. Conosce lei. Uh, Rocco is showing some of his photographs and people here is uh, recognizing other people on the photographs. That's just crazy, amazing. Until the interpreter told us they were recognizing people in the photos who still live in the town today, including an old lady who was just around the corner. We start following these locals. We're pushing Rocco in the wheelchair at this rate. We go down this tiny little alley where they bang on this woman's door. Her daughters, her two daughters come out and then the other woman who's 97 years old comes to the door and then Rocco and the women are starting to reminisce, they're starting to speak in Italian to each other and this, more, most importantly they're recognizing themselves in the photos that he took from the 40s and in, when he returned in the 70s. <laughs> Mamma mia! Questa è storica! Io stavo parlando con i cristiani, conosce questo? Sì! This old lady was here in the war. She is 96 years old. And she, they are talking about the war, the fighting. And that's incredible. That's just incredible. Show them the pictures, right? All of a sudden, they all could turn around. They all recognized. Uh, practically uh, 10 or 12 people, you know. So once her, she, oh, wait a minute, she, she was here in 92. She's 97 years old. I says, is she married? No, part her out here. I made her laugh like that. This speak started to become just as powerful as returning Al to see the grave of his squad leader. Here I was looking at the faces and the expression and the voices of these locals and what it meant to have Rocco there. They were, they were saying how historic this was and what a br brilliant reunion it was to be there since their village was destroyed in World War II. There were still bullet holes in the sides of the walls. I, don't, I haven't cried doing this project once with all the nine or so World War II veterans I've interviewed and I had to walk away because the tears were running down my face, seeing the human reaction and the human emotion between what this man from East Boston, Massachusetts meant to this little village in Italy, uh, it killed me. It, it killed me. I, I'll, I'll never look at Rocco the same way again, so. I had given Rocco the benefit of the doubt of why we were going on this little adventure. I said, all right, maybe we can actually really find this ammo crate he's been talking about. So I grabbed Rocco. We started this little wild goose chase. The locals began to show us little trails and uh, pathways that led to some farmhouses and, and broken down buildings that American forces once occupied. Uh, we did find some relics, but we never did you know, find that ammo crate we were searching for. But uh, either way, I mean, what a remarkable time that we were having. I was having a blast. I was having a blast going through this village and ultimately having a beer in the town that he liberated. We took him to a monument that his, his regiment association put up in 1992. And you know, I know Rocco was one of the main benefactors of trying to, fighting to get that monu monument erected in that town of Tremensoli in the Minterno area. And, I know him looking at that monument and touching it and looking at it and laughing to himself, I knew that he knew that this would be the last time he was visiting the monument he helped to erect. We left Tremensoli and hit the road to Rome and the sun was going down. And 
I don't think I prepared myself for the magnitude of, of human interaction that was going to happen that day. This was more than just the rifle and bringing guys back to where they fought. There was so much human emotion involved in lives that were changed from the war, and we could see it 75 years later. So our last day floating around Rome, I started to research what local museums were in the area, and I found the Rome World War II Museum. Uh, the museum was really just a private collection of a local historian who had the same uh, love and interest for the Second World War as I did. Although he was closed, he opened up his home to us, invited both Rocco and Al inside, and we got to look at his old per uh, personal collection of real World War II artifacts, uniforms, weapons, parachutes, signs, um, and supplies. So much of a quick response. Okay. Mm -hmm. We've been flying home. We're flying, we're flying home today. So we went to Anzio Martha Casino where they where these guys serve. Uh -huh. Tremens Minterno, Tremensoli, San Pietro. We visited all, all Well done. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. He's been back <coughs> this is he's been back six, some, times. six times. This is his first time in seventy five years. Oh I, I was yeah. great. Yep. Oh, the secret thing is, the uh, FI department is uh, a thousand and the the It was there we got to sit down with Rocco and Al and have them reflect on what they thought about the whole trip themselves. My name is Albert Busciarelli. I served in the 15th Infantry, the 3rd Division, over in Italy in 1943. My favorite part was where the guides had pinpointed the approximate spot of where I got hit. They had maps. And he made one remark about, well, I, I forget what it is now. Start, start, McDonald? McDonald. That was told to me when I got hit, and that stayed in my mind. That's another thing that I, re yeah. I remember somebody mentioning that. Mm. Oh. So, so we're not too far out from where you were. Not too far out. That, Mignano. Yeah. That's, they told yes. me that I was got, where I got hit was not too far from Casino at the be beginning the battle for Casino. So it's clear that if you wanted to go to Casino, you had to see these positions. Mm -hmm. And the guide says, down that clearing from here, from this parking lot, he says approximately a half a mile is possibly the place where you got hit. Hey, that was unbelievable. What we had given them for information that I knew, read, remembered, they pinpointed it all. Going up there was, how can I put it? Fantastic. I never expected I would see the monastery outside of pictures. But going up and actually seeing it, to me, was great. And the other places that we had gone to after we left the monastery, down where Rocco was, Hey, it was great. Never be forgotten. That 
già pubblico eh. quindi original tires wow. and the sign of the government on the tires wow. on the rubber of the tires okay. Okay. what's this one? Food for uh, Food. Uh, army for um, supplies. You know, I expressed special interest in a lot of this guy's items that he had in his museum, but I was really surprised when we left. He presented me with a World War II supply parachute that uh, was dropped over Rome. Glad I got to bring these gentlemen here. And Okay, tanto, tanto piacere. Tanto piacere. Rocco? Rocco. Sì. Rocco. Rocco sì. <laughs> Ciao Rocco. Ciao. When we were Boston bound on that aircraft from Rome at the end of the trip, I couldn't help but think what Alan Rocco thought of the trip. And Al specifically, he couldn't even get the words out. He just grabbed me by my shoulder and said, Andy, I can never repay you. Even though Rocco had returned to the 50th anniversary in 1995, he didn't get the same personal effect he did when he returned to Tremensoli in 2019. He, he can't stop talking about that 97-year-old woman coming out that door and, and those people he met. He made me print out photos so that he could show his doctor, he could show his tenant, he could show his lady friend, he could show all the people around town where he just came from in Italy. And he's never done that with any other trips. It was his best trip back. Everybody's clapping now, for now it. I thought they hit the lottery. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget your uncle saying you're gonna pay your taxes. <laughs> Rocco. Rocco saw his friend. Grabbing our luggage and realizing the trip was finally at its end, it was good to have members of the Boston Wounded Veteran, the local American Legion, and the news there on the curbside to welcome us home. I did my share. You did your share. I appreciate it all. No, we're already through customer. We got our bag. Can I have your attention, please? At this time, I'll be telling you about the portable mail and passengers. Traveling from Ross 12. Please take your seat. How is it over there? Yeah, the trip is ready. Just talk to Andrew about your experience, would you, sir? I was like, was with my hand, I wouldn't be what it down That's the top right off. What did you think about returning to Italy after 75 years? Unbelievable. I would have played it this time. And being in my 95th year and many, many uh, disabilities that I have, I believe in all sincerity 
but that this will be my last trip to Italy. But what I always want to think in mind is, and I go back to my 30th anniversary where General Clark said, all we asked of Italy ever is a place to bury our dead. God bless America. As I say, it's something that I never expected. I never exp think I'll ever see it again. But I, I appreciate this and I enjoy every bit of it. And I appreciate Andy and his group inviting me to this trip to Europe. Thank God you. bless them all. The rifle led us here and seeing the closure it brought to Albert and Rocco made me feel like that my mission was complete. A new way to think, a new way to see, a new way to understand the world in front of me, a new way to dream, a new way to trust, a new way of understanding you can count on us. Coming back from Italy and seeing what Al and Rocco experienced firsthand, it only opened the door for me to want to do it again. And this being the 75th anniversary of World War II, there may not be an 80th anniversary for a lot of these guys as they're now in their mid-90s. By the time I brainstormed, was able to regroup, raise some more funds, the next thing on the calendar I could see the 75th anniversary for was the Battle of the Bulge. And this time we are going back to Belgium, and not with two veterans, but 17 living World War II veterans. Something that I have to do Overseas, across the land Time for change, a helping hand Find a way to help you understand New way to think New way to see New way to understand The world in front of me a New way to dream a New way to trust a New way of understanding You can count on Again? Um, you're gonna start. <laughs> Holy, shit, that scared the shit out of me. What the <laughs> <was> that? <laughs> These headphones are trippy. Okay. <laughs> That's how I want to end the documentary. Just me doing. <laughs>